Our guest today is best known for his expertise in one specific muscle group, the glutes. And many people consider him to be the world's foremost expert in glute training. Responsible for the favorite exercise of Instagram fitness models, the barbell hip thrust, he went on to develop a portfolio of glute products and has intellectual property behind most of the glute builders on the market today. A social media following of nearly one million, a PhD in sports science, and a certified strength and conditioning specialist, he's never stopped pushing to be the best he can be. So for a lesson in how to dominate a niche in a crowded market with multiple income streams, please join me in welcoming founder of the Glute Labs, author and inventor, Brett Contreras, to the Escape Your Limits podcast. So look, thanks for inviting me to the Glute Lab in, in uh, San Diego. If I'd have known that there was a course when I was at school to kind of shape women's butts, I think, you know, everyone would have had their hand up. <laughs> so what, where, how did you come up with this as an idea? It's just been this evolution. So when I was, you know, around 15 and 16 years old, I, I started lifting weights at 15. But looking back, my, my regimen then, I did it like every night. I, would, I had a little barbell set that my mom bought me for Christmas, and I would go into the backyard and I would do... Uh, like standing military press, curls, and then calf raises, and then I would go into the house and do crunches and, and push-ups. And I, I remember I could barely get it, I probably had the worst form. But I kept, I kept at it. Now notice, I was do, wasn't doing any legs and no back. <laughs> Just training like the shoulders, the pecs, the biceps, the calves. And, but I saw results and I have an identical twin brother and I, rem I remember I weighed 15 pounds more than him and you couldn't tell. We were looking in the mirror and I'm like, where is the extra weight? And we were like, we were both in our shorts and I'm like, our calves are, look the same, our, everything looks the same and I weigh 15 more pounds. That's why I think you first hold more water and you have more density and then the muscle starts to build. But I, I didn't have any glutes. But I did have, I started getting the lines from the, you know, the push-ups and stuff. And then I remember like learning about squats and, and, and these exercises and I would try them, but I was so lanky. I was like tall and lanky and it just didn't feel right. And I didn't feel my glutes at all. And I'm like, I don't think I'm doing these right. So I just avoided them. I didn't have a coach. We, we didn't have the internet back then. So you had to learn and I didn't have a coach. So I just avoided them. And so one, two things happened right around the same time. The first was uh, I overheard a couple of girls in, in my class who, whom I had a crush on, and they're like, let's go watch football practice. I love staring at the guys' butts in their football <laughs> uniforms. And I was like, oh no, if, 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 if girls care about butts, then I'm screwed. I'm going to be a virgin for life because I have no butt. And I knew that, and I was very insecure about it, but I didn't know how to fix it. And then the second incident was I was playing golf with my sister's boyfriend, and we were on the ninth hole, I still remember it. I, I was getting ready to swing and he's like, you know, Brett, and it's funny because he wasn't this, the smartest guy, but all of a sudden he, be, he seemed so analytical. He's like, <laughs> most people, you know, he's like, it's almost like you're missing the gluteal muscles. Like your back goes right into your legs. It's like you're missing the muscles. Most people have a protuberance there that bumps out and you just have nothing. And I was like, why, why do you feel so comfortable <laughs> talking about my biggest insecurity? And I remember the, the type of guy I am, I'm, I'm not, I don't like to settle. And you know, when I got bullied, I wanted to gain muscle because I don't like being bullied. When I have no glutes, I would, I, I, you know, I remember going to sleep, like trying to go to sleep that night going, I'm not okay with this. I'm not, I, and I, I reasoned, hey, I built my pecs through strength training. How do I build my glutes? And so I went on this quest and I started reading everything I could. Like, but back then it was the muscle magazines. It was you know, muscle and fitness, flex, Iron Man, right. muscular development, and I read those four every month. And um, the, the bodybuilders didn't have a glute day. You didn't no, talk about no, glutes. Right, no. You could talk about traps, you could talk about the three delt heads, buys, yeah. tries, abs, <laughs> uh, quads, hamstrings, calves, even erectors. You could talk about everything, but no one ever mentioned glutes. Right. It was just implied. And I don't know if it was like a homophobic thing or some weird, because <laughs> yeah. you talked about every muscle except glutes. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. is leg day. I, I'm training quads and hams today, and mm. no one talked about glutes. Now, it also could add something to do with like, Vince Gironda was a popular trainer uh, back in the day, and he, he, didn't, he thought 
you know, don't do squats because they overdevelop your glutes. You want small glutes and big quads. Right. So he would do like hack squats and like frog stance things where you where it targets your quads. And then that changed over time, um, thankfully. That now you know now glutes are very popular with men and women alike. But I think I helped. So when I was 19 years old, I. I got a book from my cousin. I was training my cousin at the time. And for Christmas, he buys me this book. So this is, we're talking, I'm 42, almost 43. So 42, so we're talking 23 years ago, I get this book and it's called The Ultimate Guide to Butt and Leg Development. And I still have it. And I, I was looking through, I'm like, this is awesome. Thank you so much. You know, why'd you get this for me? And he's like, cause I've never met someone so obsessed with glutes. <laughs> and that was 23 years ago. And since then my enthusiasm has never diminished a bit. Um, in fact, it's at an all time high today. So uh, interestingly enough, you know, many years later I would write my own book that's even better than theirs. And, uh, and wow. so that's how the uh, uh, obsession came about. And it's interesting to watch from, it's almost in about two months, it'll be the 10 year anniversary to where I wrote my first article. And uh, so it's been this decade long of me putting out material. And I think I helped really sway the tides because back, back then, a lot of women just kind of trained how the men told them to. It was like, mm. you know, I'd watch girls show up to the gym and they'd be training with their boyfriend and they'd, they'd be doing body part splits. <laughs> they'd have a chest day, a back day, a shoulder day, an arm day, and then Friday was leg day and you did you know, leg press, leg extensions, and leg curls, and you're barely even working your glutes. And maybe your boyfriend taught you squats and deadlifts, um, you know, but the, a lot of the guys would skip yeah, that's right. leg day. And it was always like, oh, I'm, I'm not feeling real good. I'm just going to run. And it's like, oh, I train legs, I run. And it's like, you do all this strength training for your upper, upper body. body. And, uh, and, you know, I, I would meet girls, and I'm not the biggest guy, but whenever, uh, you know, my girlfriends, they you know, obviously see me like, you know, naked or in my boxer briefs and they'd say, wow, it's so nice seeing a guy who cares about his legs. My last boyfriend, he did this big upper body and these <laughs> little twig legs. And so leg training uh, has gotten more popular and glute training for men and women has gotten more popular. But the, the, where the tides turned for glutes was Instagram. Be be before Instagram, all the experts in strength and conditioning were men. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and, uh, and I, I remember a lot of when the hip thrust, when I came out with the hip thrust, a lot of men bashed it and it was jealousy, you know, go do a set and tell me this doesn't work your glutes. So you just, cause just to pause there for a second. So, you know, we've all seen these exercises on Instagram. You go into all the gyms and the girls are there with the sort of bar across the hips. Are, are you, are you the guy that was responsible for that then? Yep. Is that where it started? 100% <laughs> responsible for that. So. No one before me ever thought to put a bar on your lap and do a hip thrust. The, the bridging motion was popular. It's been around for many, many, like probably centuries. It's part of, you know, yoga, part of physical therapy. Um, in more recent years, coaches used it for glute activation. Uh, but you did body weight. Mm -hmm. um, you never did heavy weight. In fact, I remember when I started going to conferences, these, these guys would tell me, this is an activation movement. You don't use weight with it. You just use it for activation. I'm like, I measure the activation. Like you're, you're talking about like it's some abstract concept. I, I actually hook up, I bought my own EMG instrument from Naraxin and I have, I can measure the glute acti activity with different exercise. And when you do a body weight glute bridge, you might get 30% of MVIC, like maximum capacity. And when you do a, a 400 pound glute bridge, you get 100% of MVIC. So if we're talking activation here, we can have that conversation, but you don't even, you've never even tried it. And you're telling me, and I'm so glad I didn't back down from the guys back then because uh, they were, um, <coughs> you know, change is tough. You've seen it with when CrossFit got popular, all the strength coaches, oh, this is stupid. And it's like, what, look at what they're doing. <coughs> They're doing something right because everyone's wanting to do it yeah. and they're growing fast rather than look at what, what you know, I never want to be that way. I never want to just become this. My, I had a professor in college who called him boiled frogs. If you, the theory is if you put, if you dropped a frog in hot water, they'd jump out. But if you, you know, put them in like room temperature water and 
turn it up, they supposedly stay in there and cook to death. Now, it's probably a myth, <laughs> um, but I get the, the, point, idea. The, the, the analogy is like, don't, you, they, they can't detect change, so yeah. they just slowly die. And yeah. that's what I don't want to do. I never want to be the type that just lets the world pass me by and I'm stuck clinging to my old ways. So mm. you, the science, science is at an all time high. You've got, we've never lived in an era where there's such a rapid growth of science. There's new journals, there's open access, there's, you've got information. Now with Instagram, you got people like me posting infographics covering these journal articles. You've got so much access to information now. And so, um, yeah, but when Instagram happened, all the women, if you had a nice butt, you got a million followers real fast. <laughs> you know, if you knew what to do with, a, you, you knew how to pose and you wore the right outfits, you got a million followers. And all the guys joined Instagram and we've got like, you know, 10,000 followers. And we're like, wow, how'd they get a million followers? <laughs> So those same guys would try to comment on these women's posts who would say, this is my favorite glute exercise, the hip thrust. And you'd see a man go, that's stupid. That doesn't work. The glutes just squat. And the woman would write back, actually, I do squats and I don't feel my glutes working nearly as much, but thanks. And it would, that, that comment would get like hundreds of <laughs> likes and it shut that guy up. They realized you don't have the floor anymore. You don't have the authority anymore. There's a new platform. And the women have the voice. Um, for whatever reason, they are more popular than the men. And women wanted to hear, how, see, how do you train? How, how are you developing your glutes? I don't want to listen to this man who's telling me just squat. I want to see all the exercises you're doing. And I would say the truth is kind of in the middle. Okay. It's not just squat, but it's also not just do a new workout every day with 42 new glute exercises that you don't, you know, you got to stick to some basics yeah. and get strong at them. But that was the turning point, in my opinion. And for that, just to, for people who don't know you, give a bit of background on your, you know, you're not just an Instagram trainer that's made it big. You know, there's some real science behind you. Can, can you just sort of expand on that a little bit? Yeah, so I mean, I got my PhD in sports science uh, from New Zealand, from Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, they have a great school out there, AUT. My professor, John Cronin, he's amazing. and. Uh, he, uh, you know, he took a gamble on me. I, he, you know, I moved out there and um, studied under him. And I got my PhD, not because I wanted to be a research professor, but I was so darn curious about the differences between squats and hip thrusts. You know, what, are, what is a better exercise for the glutes? What, what, what effects do they have on performance? What are, how do their torque angle curves uh, at the hips differ? Things like that. And, and I had a really nice uh, PhD thesis. Uh, we call it a dissertation in the States, but they call it a thesis. And that led to eventually, I'm, I'm on 50 published studies right now. My name is listed on 50 published studies. And to this day, I'm working on seven articles as we speak. And that's a big time commitment. People don't realize you're always like, you know, when most people go home and go to sleep, I go home and I'm working on various articles and always staying up on the research. So that's a a big component of my life is reading research. I always tell people, you want to change the world, you want to make it big, you want to be wildly successful, because you can get very successful just, just working as a personal trainer, just working at whatever thing you do. But if you want to come up with something revolutionary, if you want to take it to the next level, you need to learn the science. You know, I just watched a, a documentary uh, two nights ago on uh, West Side, West Side versus the world, it's Louis Simmons, <laughs> He was this power lifter who, I mean, his methods, um, you know, changed, I would say he probably uh, changed the, the way the world lifts weights up there with Greg Glassman with CrossFit and then Louis Simmons mo more so than almost anyone. I would put myself up there too, because everywhere you go, they're doing hip thrusts, not just hip thrusts, but I made, I've had a lot, I had a lot to do with making band training popular. Some people would say, you, you, you created a monster there. <laughs> but the bands are indeed very useful. It's just that you'll see people ditch the weights, the, the barbells and dumbbells for them, which they shouldn't do. Right. And, uh, uh, and, and Louis, he was a, you know, you could say, oh, it's a dumb meathead powerlifter. And he learned the science. He had to learn the Russian, the Soviet methods. And, um, and that's, how you, that's how you do it. And it's funny because this is, uh, we're going to be talking about entrepreneurial stuff, but I'm doing really well right now financially, but it was never my goal. Uh, and I, I was never doing that well until the last couple of years. But I laid a, almost a 10-year foundation, yeah, 
before I was a personal trainer and a CSCS for a decade before I ever, I think 12 years before I ever wrote my first article for T Nation. I became right. one of their popular writers. And then after that, you know, uh, I, I, yeah, I worked with thousands of people before I ever like really established a big platform. Was that, what was your intention then? Just to, well not just to, but you, you went to, to get your PhD. What did you plan to do when, you, when you'd got there? So I was already a popular blogger. Um, so I knew I could just make a living. You know, there's a lot of ways to make money in this industry. And interesting, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second, mm. but I just wanted to get my methods popular. It's funny, I, I remember watching uh, this show House of Cards or something. It's with Kevin Spacey, and I only watched one episode, so um, I think that's the name of it. Um, but anyway, in that episode, he says a lot of people, they think money is more important than power, and they have it all wrong. Power is the most important thing. And that's what I loved in when I started blogging and got in, gaining popularity. And we had a, we had a, on Facebook, we had a community, and I was plugged in. You know, I knew all the people, I went to all the conferences, I shook their hand, I had a beer with them, I looked them in the eye and had a good conversation. We could gauge each other's character. So I was plugged in and I had power. That was cooler to me than I've never been driven by, by money. Now it's cool because I can do a lot of cool things with that money, but it was never my goal. It was to educate and, you know, I would love it. I would go speak in Barcelona, they're doing hip thrusts. I would go speak in... You know, I'd go to Auckland, I'd go to Sydney, I'd go to Oslo in Norway, I'd go to London, anywhere I went, uh, whether it's Canada, Mexico, any country I've been to, I, in that gym, they're doing hip thrusts. And they're doing my, not just hip thrusts, but they're doing my glute methods. I'll see people, and, and now I get recognized places. I had a, a friend, uh, she, was a, she won the, the, the US Bikini Olympia, and she'd be like, just yes, someone was asking for my autograph, and I'll, I'm like, sure, let me sign it. And she's like, God, doesn't this make, doesn't this make you sick? And I'm like, no, no, I, I love this. Like, I, I, I get like a few days a year when I'm at conferences to feel like a celebrity. I wish it was all day, every day. <laughs> um, I don't know if I really would like that. Like if I went outside and everyone was like, <laughs> but anyway, it does feel cool. And I don't take it for granted because I grew up, I was a high school math teacher in my 20s. And I made 30 grand a year in Arizona. I mean, I think I topped out at 36,000. That's with wow. a master's degree. And I didn't come from money. And my family isn't a bunch of rich people. And I, I always know this could be taken away. If, like for, like for example, if Instagram went down or changed their algorithms and all of a sudden I, I'm just another guy. And so I don't take it for granted. So I never stopped doing the things that made me popular. Like, if you DM me, there's a chance I might respond. I try, I, about two hours every night, I try to respond to people on Instagram. If, if I see people at conferences, I try to shake their hand and talk to them, and I never want to have an ego like some of the guys in our field who have these giant egos, and I'm like, why do you have such an ego? You're a personal trainer. Yeah. At the end of the day, we're personal trainers, yeah. and uh, not, no one has a right to think they're above anyone in this world, but surely, it just, uh, and I remember being told, by a lot of the industry leaders who I think, looking back, I realized they were threatened by me because I beat to the tune of my own drum. And they'd be like, you know, Brett, your problem is you're too accessible. You don't create that scarcity. You know, people, why would people come to your seminars when they can DM you when you're giving all your info out for free? You need to, you know, don't quit giving so much out and charge the big bucks and, you know, don't, you, you can't get a hold of Barack Obama, they, they would tell me. Why should they be able to get a hold of you? And I'm like, I like this though. Why, why would I stop doing what I like? And yeah. so I, I think Instagram rewarded the people who were interacting. I think their algorithms they were rewarding because why did I go up so fast and those people didn't? Yeah. But now those people who 10 years ago, five years ago even, they're, a lot of them have fizzled away and they're not popular anymore. So I, I never want to stop you know, helping people and realizing my place like I'm I am in a unique position to help a lot of people and and by the way I get rewarded for that too so yeah. it, it helps me and I think a lot of people like you know I, I train my glute squad I work with a lot of people here and then they tag me 
and they see me joking around and trying to be funny. It makes me human. Yeah. It makes me relatable. So those people should have been doing what I was doing why, uh, the whole time around. But so what was the what was the sort of so you left you you, you was a, you was a teacher. And then what was the transition to kind of where you are? You know, what, what was some so of the sort of key moments? So here's another incident that had two different stories. Right. So there was two different uh, situations that happened that caused me to leave teaching. Uh, the first was during my master, I got my master's degree in secondary education and curriculum instruction. I think that gives me advantage on social media because I'm a teacher. Yeah. And I look at things like I need to educate people. Yeah. That's the secret to it all. Yeah, be, I guess. Always teaching be people. teaching people. Yeah. But uh, 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 I had a, a, uh, my professor for my master's degree. She said, Brett, I turned in a project on exercise science, even though I was a math teacher. And she said, Brett, in 13 years of being a professor, this is the best I've ever seen. Like, you put more work into this than anyone who, and I did. I, I couldn't stop working on this thing. <laughs> I was so passionate about it. She said, life is too short to waste doing what you're not passionate about. She goes, I have no doubt you're a good math teacher, but this is your passion, you need to pursue it. And I couldn't stop thinking about that. And then the other thing is, I, uh, this was after school, I had a, a teacher friend, she and I were like this, and she comes in after class and she's like, hey Brett, uh, I'm going to a wedding this weekend and I have a guy there that I really like, but I don't have a date and I want him to notice me, I want him to like me, would you be my date? And, uh, and then she was joking, like, don't say anything and just maybe just speak in a Russian accent. I'm like, why can't I talk? <laughs> um, but she's like, come to think about it, you're almost perfect on paper. She's like, you're tall, you're, you know, decent looking, you're funny, you're, you're intelligent, you're witty, you're athletic. You're, it gave me all these comments. She goes, yeah, your only flaw is that you don't make any money. And I was like, you remember I told you, I, I'm not content. So I... I, I think, I'm pretty sure I joined Amazon that day um, and I got a, an account. This was many, many years ago and uh, probably, yeah, probably like 15, 18, 20, I don't know when Amazon started. But anyway, I got an Amazon account and I bought two books that day. One was by Robert Kiyosaki, who wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and the mm -hmm. other was by, ironically, by Donald Trump and Robert Kiyosaki and it was on making money. <laughs> who knew he would one day become president? And, uh, <laughs> We won't talk story. about it. We won't, yeah, that's another story. But anyway, uh, I, I was, you know, the, the wheels started turning. I, and I remember I always thought, you know, I deserve to be making six figures. I'm talented. I, I know that if I was plugged into the right environment, I would have like a boss that really liked me and I could really impress him because I'm, I'm talented. I'm creative. I, I do things I think the way other people don't. And now I realize. I could have never worked for anyone. I need to be an entrepreneur. And there's a lot of people out there like me who you should be an entrepreneur. But looking back when I started, I was so scared because I didn't have security. Like, how, how do I know I'm going to make yeah. a living? Now it's easier for people with everyone has a, a PayPal, a, an, an Instagram, a, a link tree and, and all these, you know, yeah. you can just make money very easily now. Whereas back when I was growing up, you know, you had one job and that was it. You didn't yeah. go get a second job. What would you have done? You would have had to go door to door and say, hey, I'm going to mow your lawn. Can I mow your lawn or be your pool boy or something? And you can uh, pay me by check or mm -hmm. cash. Now it's just you can do things online. It's, yeah. it's, it's, a great, it's a great day and age for entrepreneurs. Yeah, different, very different world. So you made a decision that you wanted to make money. Was wanted that... to do fitness and I wanted to make more money. So I thought I'll open up a gym. And so I was living in Scottsdale, Arizona at the time. And I just decided to go for it. I opened up my own gym. What about finance? Did you have nope, any I've never, uh, so, okay. I didn't open up, so I read a, a book that said you need like five months of operating expenses saved up mm. before you open up a gym. And I didn't have any money saved up. But I had equipment from saving up as a teacher. I had a, you know, a power rack glute ham developer. I had the best power rack and platform from Elite FTS. I had a glute ham developer, a 45 degree hyper, a nice one, a reverse hyper, a sled, all specialty barbells, a competition bench, you know, plates, dumbbells. And I had, a, I had an amazing garage gym. And I said to myself, if I can get 10 paying clients, then I'm making three grand a month, that would pay, at least pay the rent and right. I can work on building up there. So I said, 
when I get 10 paying clients, pay me 300 a month, then I will open up my own gym and I'll negotiate for two free months. Cause I know if I have two, two months, I can build my clientele. Well, that's exactly what I did. And by the two month, though I found that two month grace period was over. I already had, uh, by the, my end of third month, I had 55 clients and I was making like seven grand a month already, you know, almost double what I was as a teacher. And with the, with the client building, I just want to touch on that a little bit, because I guess most businesses, when they're starting, that's the problem, is getting clients. You know, what, what was your success? It was just in, word of mouth. Word of mouth. But, but I, had my, I had my scorcher, my hip thrusting right. machine, and it was the first of its kind. So with some of that, if, if you look back in terms of what helped people talk about you, do you think some of that was that you kind of created a, a bit of a different you know, message or story than what anyone else was doing at the time, do you yep. think? And that's what's funny is people would come train with me. And a lot of times, like I remember one client, her name was Leslie. She was responsible for 13 clients in the, in the gym. She had gotten 13 of her friends and family members. And, and then th through them, they probably got, so yeah, it was just word of mouth. And it was just, I would have, this happened twice where someone would be training and they'd go and I didn't like people using phones back then. You could still, now it's just, <laughs> I don't even fight that battle, but, um, they, 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 in the middle of the workout, you'd see them on their phone over by the cubbies, and all of a sudden they'd go, my, my daughter's on her way. They'd call, and I was always like, what is the daughter just hanging out in workout clothes, ready to come by? Because <laughs> 10 minutes later, she'd show up. And then I'd train the daughter with the mom, and they, she'd go, you got to try this. This is amazing. But I was, I mean, I'm the OG with glute training. Yeah. Now everyone's doing it. But that, I, it, was, it was the system I set up. Back at the gym was called Lifts, and it was in Scottsdale, it was in Ganey Ranch, and I gave women the workout they wanted. Was that was that a conscious business decision? Because it sounded like looking back, and it's like, well, that's a genius. You know, if you wanted to create a business plan, you'd differentiate yourself, and you'd you know, sort of you know, come up with something that no one else has done, which is what you did. Was that the plan, or was that just you were no, passionate about it's glutes? Just coincidence, and, really. You know, I look at every single thing that happened along the way, and I won't remember them all right now, but I was thinking about this the other day. When I thought up the hip thrust, I was going to write a T-Nation article. I thought about it. I thought up the hip thrust. It was this reverse hyper right here. I put a glute ham developer right here, and you put your back on the glute ham, the rounded pad of the glute ham developer, your feet on there, and I would sink way down and thrust up. And I put a dip belt around me and four plates, <laughs> and I did 15 reps, and my glute felt like it was going to pull. And I went, this is an awesome exercise. But think about that. What if you were doing them and these split apart? You'd fall and hit your <laughs> tailbone. It was a dangerous movement. So I was, try I was getting my clients to do it, and they loved it. And they're like, this is such an awesome exercise. And I was telling my aunt, who I was training at the time, I want to do, you know, I want to teach people how to do this exercise. But and she's like, sounds like you need to invent something. And I'm like, I don't know how to invent anything. She's like, sure you can. You can do it. Let's do it right now. And I got out a piece of paper, and we drew up a design. I wouldn't have done it if it weren't for her. Wow. Then I decided to patent it. And my, my patent attorney said, Brett, you know that article you sent me that, that used EMG, electromyography? Why don't you do that on your stuff? And I was like, why don't I? And, I, and coincidentally, Naraxin, the leaders in EMG uh, were, were like, they're in the world. They were a block away from me. <laughs> and I went to them and they taught me how to do EMG. And that was his idea. And then that led to me being way more scientific than other people. Cause I did like, I, I rented it for two and a half months and did like two and a half straight, my poor girlfriend at the time, I, I was just being <laughs> my underwear with electrodes hooked up to me for like two and a half straight months doing experiments. And then on, on my clients too. And I learned a ton that way. And then you look at all this stuff. Okay. The, the glute guy nickname that came from Martin Rooney. I was at a perform better seminar and he said, we, we talked for 45 minutes about glutes and he's like, you should call yourself the glute guy. And then glute lab, glute lab is my clients, Sammy and Aaron. They were talking, they're like, you should call it this glute lab. And they even went home and made me a, lo a logo. Like they forced it on me. And now look, I'm writing a book that'll be in two months. This book will be done in the books called glute lab. And I'm probably going to franchise this place. Wow. And that was all their idea. And then the, the glute squad, that was just the girls that I trained were, they would call themselves the glute squad. I mean, I could go on and on. Yeah. It's just, I, I think you could think it's just plain luck, but at least I, I pay attention when someone comes up with a good idea. I was like, that's genius. And I so what would you, it, it. It, it, it sounds like, you know, there was a combination of things going on, but if you had to sort of 
look back and give advice to probably people that are coming into a very crowded space, you know, lots of trainers now. What, what are some of the key things, you know, going from, I guess, you know, school to, to tr business to scaling your business by having, because, you know, you, well, as you know, you, you, you know, there's only so many hours in a day and you're going to max out as a trainer, even if you're charging a lot. You then created a product where you can expand it. You know, how would you summarize, you know, that history in terms of key lessons? Ooh, so it's, that's a good question because I look at the way I went about it and I wouldn't change anything. I mean, look <laughs> where I am now. I'm, I'm doing very well, but it's different now. You know, when I started, it was like, and that's, I think, what annoys the old time. I guess I'm an old timer. I'm 42. I mean, am I old enough to be an old timer? But I looked at these young bucks and I'm like, you don't have the expertise. You're 20 years old, you've been lifting weights for two years and you have your own ebook and you're a coach. Um, but everyone's an entrepreneur now. Like <laughs> I waited till I'd been personal training for you know 12 years until I wrote my first article. And even when I was blogging, I was researching every night. It's like everyone, we all like to lift weights. Look at you, I could tell. You lift weights, you like it, it's fun. So, but that doesn't mean you'll, have a good business, a good fitness business, you know? So, um, so looking back, it's like, you can sure start out when you're younger, but you gotta be hungry. And if, 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 if you just like to lift weights, you can, you can be a popular trainer. I mean, if you're jacked, you'll probably be the most popular trainer in your gym. Doesn't mean you're the best, it just means people will assume you have credibility. But if you really wanna do well, then you've gotta start uh, studying and you've got to study both the science of you know exercise exercise science you've got to know the science of hypertrophy getting muscles bigger the science of strength getting stronger the science of fat loss and optimizing body composition and nutrition and all that stuff and biomechanics and physiology and there's so much to learn but that alone, so that gives you scientific knowledge so you can come out with better content, mm -hmm. but you also have to study your business. And for me, I always laugh because all these, the business gurus back in the day, and I think it was, they were just insecure that they didn't have an Instagram following. They're like, Instagram doesn't mean crap. You can have followers and it doesn't amount to anything. The, the way for you to do your business is through newsletter marketing or email marketing and creating a big list and having a popular blog and those are your core subscribers. And I think I send out one newsletter a month, if that. And I, I just focused on Instagram. And let me tell you, you can make plenty of money on Instagram. Now, Instagram might change. Is that a vulnerability, do you think? Like it, it is. It, it's it, like right. Facebook owns Instagram and Facebook algorithms changed. When is Instagram gonna change? But it, I guess what I'm saying is uh, a lot of these in, a lot of these business gurus, like the people teaching you, uh, hey, I'm a I'm a, a, a social media expert, and then you look and they don't have many social media <laughs> followers. The people who are good at it are busy doing it. Yeah, you know, I'm crushing it on social media right now, so I'm not going to change my business and help other people. I'm too busy basking in the sun because I am doing well on social media. So it's a lot of these social these business gurus they give the worst advice mm. and they're telling these people hey go take a selfie every day and try to put some quote on it and it's like you're 20 years old no one cares what your <laughs> philosophy of life is you know what i mean they, if you're good looking they want to look at your picture they're not going to buy your product or your service you got to learn the business side of things and there's a lot that goes into that and you got to mm. study the numbers and so you know Cool, and, and a lot of the women that I train, some of them have a million followers, but it's 80 for 85% male following. Yeah. <laughs> so those males aren't gonna buy your product, or so you only have 50, so you really have 150,000 women who might buy your stuff. Right. If you're going, I don't mean to knock it, if, uh, if you're just trying to, if it's like a hobby, and you're just love your, the, you know, you love your hobby and you're just doing it, you're just posting, you know, selfies and things like that to just, highlight your your efforts that's totally fine but if you're in this to make money and establish a business then you need to put more thought into it the types of posts and interestingly nsca has just asked me to do a a talk at their national conference on growing your social media so i, I made a list of like 40 things that uh, uh that i've thought out and uh, mm. there's a there's an art to it so what are some of the things that you found that work in terms of 
of, of social media. You know, people are spending a lot of time putting stuff out and, you know, you don't know whether it's the algorithm or what, what's going on. You know, based on your experience and you, you are, you know, I guess a, an expert because your results speak for themselves, what, what works and what should people be thinking, even if you are a 20-year-old trainer that's getting into it? One of the things that doesn't work is what I call this image crafting obsession with these youngsters. It's like, you're all out, it's funny because, I mean, I'm, I'm 42 years old, but I, in my 20s, I partied. No one heard of me because I was, I loved my weekends. I never got into drugs, but I drank like a fish and I, I had a lot of fun, okay? <laughs> I lived for the weekends. And looking back, I was living my best life ever, but I was insecure about it. I could hear my dad going, you need to like, get serious and buckle down and quit partying so much. Mm. We didn't draw attention to it. I surely wouldn't have been posting on social media if we had it back then, <laughs> living my best life ever. Like you're supposed to, there's supposed to be a good balance there of work and school and studying and, and your social life. Yeah. And I probably was leaning too much towards my, so I mean, I, I was a teacher, I got my master's degree, I got my CSCS certification. I was always reading and learning, but I, definitely didn't, wasn't pushing my career hard. I see these people now always in traveling mode and then, okay, so that's fine if you don't want a business, but don't complain why your business sucks when you're in constant travel mode because you're never going to be that productive if you're in Bali one week and then the next week you're here and because and, flights, you're not productive at airports and your plane gets delayed and you're on the, you're stuck on the tarmac with no Wi-Fi, and you're in some random hotel that doesn't have a good internet connection, and you're never gonna be as productive as you are traveling as you could be at home with a routine. Mm -hmm. um, but this image crafting, it's like, look at me, look at my life, I'm so amazing. That doesn't, all you're doing is making people feel insecure. Like, uh, you know, I, I don't happen to drive a nice car, but I could if I wanted to, I could afford a top of the line car. If I had a Lamborghini, you're not going to see me kicking back <laughs> on the Lamborghini posting pictures of me my, myself saying living my best life ever. Because that just made people like my, my, my colleagues would look at that going, oh man, I, I don't have a Lamborghini. He must be killing it. And you make them feel bad about mm. themselves yeah. instead of you should be trying to make people feel good about themselves and building them up. Yeah, you know, build the people up. Don't try to you know, do this image crafting. And I know people who these 20 year olds who rent cars and pretend it's theirs. <laughs> and they, they, they wear, they'll dress up in a suit and do the rock where you're like adjusting your cufflinks while looking off into the distance. <laughs> like, what, that doesn't work. You know, I, I also see like a lot of people just take a picture and, and be like, who's ready to get after it today? Tag someone if, you're, if you hit it hard in the gym today. That doesn't work. Like you gotta put some thought into it. So I always tell people, Take your three people you like the most on social media, who you learn from, who you look forward to their posts every week. Study them. What are they doing? What is their branding? What are their, what, what types of posts? Because me, I have, I can post infographics. I can post videos of my clients working out. I can post videos of me working out. I can post, uh, I don't do much selfies. I probably would do more selfies if I was just shredded year round, but I'm not. <laughs> but uh, even so, I would have a teaching component to it. I wouldn't just be like, I, I see a lot of fitness people apologizing. Sorry, I haven't posted a physique, pro a physique update in the last few. Like, you don't have to, you don't owe it to people to always be posting your physique out there. But anyway, <laughs> um, there are different types of posts. You can have the carousel post where you swipe left and those, do really well with some people. Lately, there's this trend for the, the women just look amazing in these Gymshark out, out apparel, mm -hmm. and they have like the title, like, like glutes or quads or, or targeting whatever muscle, and then they point to it and start laughing. I don't know why they have to giggle and laugh, <laughs> but anyway, they'll point to it and be like, <laughs> like delts. <laughs> It drives me crazy because why the giggling? But they crush it. <laughs> so I would probably do it too if that's what crushed. Right. But guys can't, I would look stupid doing that. But anyway, <laughs> you can look at what they do. And I've trained half of those girls here at Glute Lab. They come to visit me. It's San Diego, I, I'm in San Diego, it's a destination spot. And they study their craft. Right. So a lot of people might be haters and be like, oh, 
that stupid bimbo just has a good body and she's got a million, 1.5 million followers. Well, let me tell you, uh, there's a lot of girls with good bodies who don't have a lot of followers. Yeah. They put on the clothing, they know the angles, they know the angles to film, they know the angles to take pictures. They'll take pictures, they'll look at the lighting in here and they'll go against that brick wall and they pose and they take 30 shots to get the right one. And then they go and they have to edit everything and they know the filters and all that. My, my point is, nothing's as easy as people think. Right. And I know there's one that visited me last month and she actually went, she got her law degree and uh, abandoned it to do fitness and she has an app and I think she's making several million a year right now. So she's making way more, she's making more than lawyers or partners <laughs> who have been doing this for 30 years. So there's a lot of money to be made. And so if, for me, you know, I lived through the time of 2006 and seven. You asked me about when I got started. I was crushing it. Then the housing market collapsed you know, in the United States, it, it, it was just soul sucking. It just demoralized me because I did nothing wrong and everyone's business failed back then, mm -hmm. you know, or took a huge hit. So I went back to the drawing boards and said, okay, I'm going to close up my gym. Uh, I'm not going to renew when there's no foot traffic. No one's doing it. So I decided, okay, what, what could I be doing right now? I'm going to blog. But before I blog, I need to have something to sell. That's when I created my ebook. Right. I created my ebook so when I, at least when I blog, people can buy it and I can make 30 bucks here and there. And is that a good strategy for trainers to have outside of their normal, you know, well, if you so can have a product? Blogging's not as cool now. Right. Back then, that was the thing. Yeah. Uh, you, like I said, you did your, you filmed a YouTube video, you wrote up a blog, you might embed that YouTube video into the blog, and then you posted the URL on Facebook and Twitter. And that was how we did it for, for like 10 years, we did it that way. And then Facebook changed their algorithms, and now instead of getting 2,000 likes and 500 shares, you're getting 300 likes and 50 shares, and it's like your mom commenting, good job, son, <laughs> and it's embarrassing. So I abandoned ship at that point. A lot Face of guys- Leaving Facebook, you mean? Yeah, I just yeah, quit altogether, yeah. but a lot of guys uh, still do their face, because you don't want all your eggs in one basket, so they still try. But I just know, I did a little test of about, it was in, a, I think it was January or December, I did, I think I made like, like five, U, five to eight YouTube videos in like a six week period and I gained like 30,000 followers. So I know that when I need to, if I needed to jump ship to YouTube, I could crush it on YouTube. So YouTube's still working for you, is it? It's not, I quit, oh, but okay. I just wanted to test and see yeah. if I could do it. I, I plan on sticking with it, but it's really hard to do all of them, yeah. to do YouTube well. For me to do Twitter well, that's more the scientists, you know, and it's a lot of effort. And they aren't, the scientists aren't buying your products. No. Um, Facebook, the algorithms change, and I, I think they reward people who are sponsoring posts. You've got to be sponsoring and doing ads and stuff. Well, I don't like doing that because I did that for a couple months. I had a bunch of ads going, and I'm not saying I never will do that, but you gain a lot of people who they don't know you. So they'll sign up for my booty by Brett or they'll buy my glute loop. And my followers love the program. They, they trust me. They try what I tell them to do and they see results. The people who don't follow me, they're like, this glute loop's too, t too small. And I'm like, you, you need it to be small so it's snug, so there's tension, right. so it doesn't fall off your legs. It's the right size. And I have to tell, so they, they'll complain and like file a charge back and send some nasty email. I don't like dealing with that. So even though I make more money when I do ads, I don't like the customer service issues that go along with it. A perfect day for me, everyone's happy, no yeah. one complains. That means more to me than, you know, than making the most possible money, so. And in terms of sort of breaking that down in terms of what's going on there, so I guess you've got a group of people that have already got to know you and your methodology prior, and then when you're, when you're actually selling them something, they already kind of get the philosophy and what they're buying as opposed to, you know, sort of ramming people in that, don't have that experience and then I'm not. Yeah, I've heard it. people call it like push versus pull marketing. Okay. Yeah, but it sounds. I don't know what that means, yeah. but I think I, I pull them in instead of pushing them. I don't know yeah. if, that's, if I have that right, but there yeah, are makes two, sense, different, so two different philosophies of, uh, I don't want, you know, I don't know when the average length of a subscriber to Booty by Bread or my personalized programming or, but I just know that I keep 
keep coming out with good content on social media, on Instagram, I'm gaining a thousand followers a day. Okay, so if things don't change, I have 700,000 followers. In one year, I'll have over a million if things continue. Yeah. And so my income kind of goes up steadily with that because there's, I'm not doing some crazy things to get a bunch of followers who follow me for the wrong reasons. I stick to educating and the people who, you know, it's like, all right, so I had a friend who, who wrote an ebook. He had 80,000 followers. He wrote an ebook and made $600,000 off of it. You don't have to have, it's just that his 80,000 followers really like his stuff. Right. I also know people who have, like, uh, I know someone who has 1.5 million followers, but again, it's 80 some percent men. And if she came out with a product, it wouldn't do well. Right. So if, you're, if, you, if this is a business for you, you gotta treat it like a business. If you're a, a ripped dude or a, 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 a woman with an amazing body, you can use that and gain a ton of followers. That doesn't mean you will increase your income. What type of followers are you getting? So that's why a lot of the colleagues that come train here, they're educating themselves. They're the people who are, yes, they have the bodies, but they're also gaining the intelligence. They're, and they're, they're networking. They're here learning from me. They'll post a YouTube video about it. And, uh, and they educate their, their people, and their people love them for it, because they're not lazy. What I said, the, the bottom line is, uh, one of the best piece of advice I can give to you is, like, look at your day, because you can, you, can, you can lounge around half the day, and you won't really get anywhere. Now, you can also be busy most of the day, but you can be busy not doing much. You can be busy, oh, I'm, I'm busy, but I'm scrolling through Instagram. That's a hobby. If you're just, now it is, it's not a hobby if you're analyzing what people are doing or if you're answering DMs and there's a strategy to it. But uh, you, you, you need to go, everyone has to get out of their comfort zone. I don't care who you are. Those girls who have a ton of followers who get a lot of hate, that, that's, uh, it might make some people feel better to go, oh, that dumb bimbo, she doesn't do, no. She had to create their app, the app. That's, that's a lot of work. Yeah. I don't have an app, um, or they had to make a product, or they had to do something to make their money, but they also are posting every day to Instagram. Now, some of them just do a selfie, or here's my workout, but a yeah. lot of them try to educate, and they're way more consistent than the haters that are judging them. Yeah. So you got to be consistent, you got to be teaching, and uh, you got to be experimenting and trying new things. You know, I'm always trying new things, and I, it's kind of like that Bruce Lee quote, you uh, you absorb what works and you reject what, what yeah. doesn't work. And so, I don't know, I just butchered that quote. But anyway, you, uh, yeah. it's, 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 you got to always be, and you know, your story. People I see get, it's like every day I wake up, I don't have a, a calendar. It's like, post this today, post this tomorrow. Every, today I need to make a post and it's now 3.13 in the afternoon. And I'm like, oh shoot, I forgot about Instagram. I need to make a post. So I'll be like, what could I post about today? I have a list of ideas, but I need to do them. Right. And so sometimes I'll just look around and go, oh, I could post about this or this. But, How often uh, are you posting? What's, what's your sort of? Probably like six, five to eight times a week. Five, right. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, but I, I want to educate people. So I'm always trying to post, you know, content is king. What you won't see is filler posts. And that's what I see a lot of people doing. It's like, like in the gym, we talk about junk volume. This is like junk social media posts. Just don't just be like, I have nothing posted today, so I'm gonna make something stupid up and use an old selfie of me and just, so I would say put some thought into it and don't just post. And also know what's feed worthy versus story worthy. It's like a lot what's of- What's that? Explain those two. You have your feed, your Instagram feed, and then you have your story. Okay. The story is where it's like, this is get to know me, you know, I'm inviting you into my life. It's kind of, you can inject humor and things like that, but this, the feed is more for your, this is more of my business, and this is gonna set the tone of like, you know, how you, uh, that's more of your business. Mm -hmm. Now, they complement each other, because on your story, you can let people see who you are, and you can give them some insight into, you know, and also it's for sharing other people who tag you, and that's, I think, where people see me and they're like, oh, he's got some personality to him. And he, obviously there's these girls hugging him and talking, saying good things about him. 
he must be a decent guy. Yeah. When you don't have any of that, there's no social proof. No. Like, I don't know this guy, but if you see all these people raving about him and me taking selfies with all these people that are, you know, and then they're, you read the things they write about you. And if they're saying good things, like this guy's amazing, he taught me so much, or I had a great session with him, okay. I think this guy, I think this guy's legit. Yeah. I, might, I might click on his profile and see what he's selling. Does he have some programs? What is he, well, you know, yeah. what is this guy all about? And they'll delve deeper. What's your view on work? You know, like, like looking at where you are, you've got a big following, you've got multiple products, you, you've got a few different business streams. Is, again, I'm talking to sort of people who are getting into this, you know, how much time and effort does it take? Because on, when, when you look, I suppose, on social media, it's like, oh, well, they, you know, they're having fun, they're in the gym, they're taking selfies. You know, what, what's the real life of building a business like you? How many, how many hours a day, a week do you work? And is it hard or have this you got one of those, what they call businesses, yeah. like a four hour work week or something like that? <laughs> this is a great question. And I work like, I don't know, lots of hours, but here's the deal. Uh, it depends on what people's definition of work is. When I'm lifting weights, that's work. Cause I'm experimenting and I'm walking the walk and I'm learning. I'm always trying different things in the gym. How are you going to learn about fitness if you're not exercising? Okay. When I'm reading and studying, that's work. I'm learning. When I'm on social media, I'm not screwing around. I'm not on the search bar. Like now, now, you know, I'm searching for things. I'm, and even when I'm clicking like on my colleagues stuff, they notice that. And those are the people who support you. And it's, you got to network a little bit. So that's work. Um, when I'm training people, that's work. When I'm, it's like, so I'm working all day long, but it's a mix of things. If I had to personal train eight hours a day, I would, it's exhausting. Podcasting is exhausting. After this, I'm going to be tired. But when you, uh, when you mix, when you have a big, and that should be people's goals to make it like throughout, because the, then you're not bored. Like you look at, maybe I'm busy for, you know, I like watching TV at night. I like reading fiction, but maybe if, if there's 24 hours in a day and I sleep, I should sleep more, but I probably sleep six hours. So there's 18 waking hours, maybe 14 of those hours I'm working, but it doesn't feel like it's hard work because two hours I'm lifting weights, you know, three hours I'm in the gym training people. I have a podcast for an hour. I'm working on the book for two hours. I'm doing Instagram for three hours. And so there's nothing that's, I'm working on a journal article for an hour there's, and, and reading for an hour and even going on a walk, <laughs> you're exercising, but it's good for stress relief and you know, you can think and chill out. And so it, that should be your goal to be mm -hmm. busy and build up the discipline that that's your, you know, that's what I see. That's different from probably guys like me and you, my day, my daily habits are to work most of the day, but it doesn't feel like work. But mm. I work circles around a lot of these people <laughs> who don't love their craft. Yeah. Because I love my craft, it's not hard work. And I, I feel like we're so lucky to have that. So lucky because I remember the jobs when I worked in the cubicle, when I cold called people, telemarketing. Oh my God, <laughs> that makes you appreciate when you actually have a job you love because it doesn't feel like hard work. You, what's the worst day possible, Brett? actually photo shoots for a book are the worst days, but it's like, cause they're like 15 hours of shooting and it's stressful and you got to get all these shots. But even that's not that bad of a day because you're in the gym interacting and having fun. It's not nearly as bad as that 10 hour day of being in a cubicle or working some office yeah. job and something you're not passionate about. What's your view on, on finding like a passion? Do you think it's, you know, there's two ways of looking at it either, you know, making a business, coming into a business where you can make enough money to do what you enjoy doing and have lots of holidays and travel or, or having a business where you can, you know, you just enjoy it and you love every part of it. What, what's your views on, on those two things? Well, I think it's just, you know, well, so I'm lucky to be doing what I love, but I also looking back, like I took, I think I took like 40 credits too much, too many in college because I just loved, I wanted to take every undergraduate course. So like I took, you, you name an undergrad course, like anthropology, you know, history, economics, um, econ uh, uh, sorry, uh, philosophy, psychology, sociology, criminal justice. I took every course you could take. 
I just love learning. So I think that's an, an innate thing, this passion for learning. I have Discover Magazine. I love reading about science. I sometimes wish I was, you know, I could, uh, I, I feel like I, I look at what massage therapists do and I could, I'm like, I could be a better massage therapist than most of these people. I look at physical therapy. I could be really good at, yeah, a really good physical therapist. I look at, you know, whether it's personal training, whether it's, if I was just a research professor, I think I could build up my school. I could do a lot of things, but it's all fitness related. What about other, I think other branches of science I could get into, but that's kind of your, your, your job in life. Your goal is to find the career. You got, and you gotta be passionate. And mm. you get passionate through reading and learning. And I don't see enough reading. I always tell people, you should read as hard as you lift. Yeah. Everyone, we all love going to the gym for an hour and a half. Did you also read for an hour and a half, mm. or at least 45 minutes, maybe half of that time? If you did that, you'd see a lot more success. Yeah. You seem as though you're very focused. You know, your brand itself is, you could call it a really, really niche brand. You know, it's glutes, it's a glute lab. What's your thoughts on focus in business? Because, you know, you've just prior, you said, you know, you could be a physiotherapist, you could be this, you, you could probably be many things. And I guess as you've built success, it could be tempting to start diversifying. And yet you've always stayed true. What advice would you give to any entrepreneur about focus or yeah. diversification? So uh, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. So me being the glute expert makes me more money. I'm the glute, hey, he's the glute expert. But for me, it kind of sucks sometimes because I also know a lot about powerlifting, strength, like sports science, strength training for, and like sprinting, jumping, you know, explosion, uh, uh, even pain and physical therapy. I've, I've taken the time to learn a lot of this stuff and people assume, oh, he's just a glute expert. So a lot of times, like most podcasts, I just get asked about the glutes the whole time. And I like getting questions about other things. I like showing off my knowledge. And so sometimes people assume that I don't know. I'm, I'm reading every night about a lot of different things. And I've been in the game for a lot of years. And I read, before I read journal articles, I read every Teen Asian article, every article on Elite FTS, but back when they had it, all these other websites that have gone, muscle magazines. I like studying how every uh, bodybuilders, powerlifters, Olympic weightlifters, strongmen, MMA, like you name it, I like in Olymp any Olympics where I like studying how they train. Mm. So, uh, you, but you you try to be the jack of all trades guy, and you won't get far. You have right. to find a niche. Right. Okay. What mindset? How how important is it in in your business and training with people to be able to sort of you know work on your mind and and, and get that in order. To, to be successful and you know, what are some of the things that you use on that side? You know, there's that abundance versus scarcity mindset. And I haven't like studied that a ton, but it's so true. I see a lot of people, you know, I've trained people who come here and they'll come here to work out and they'll say, hey, they'll, they'll write me, hey Brett, let's do a workout. I'll have, my, I'll have my partner come film the workout and we'll post it on social media and then we do that and then they don't post anything. Then I post a video. They don't hit like. They don't even comment. And I'm like, what's wrong with you? Like, if you want to help people, post that video. And come on mine and answer questions. Be relatable. But some people are afraid to tag others. I had my trainer count up how many times I've tagged people. It took him like a week. Uh, in my, I think I've posted like, say, 3,000 times. I've tagged 3,000 people in my posts. And I'm doing fine. They think that if I tag this person, you know, uh, I'm, I'm training these ladies later on. If I tag them, they're gonna go to them and buy their stuff and they're gonna ignore me. That's not the way it works. I tag them, out of my 700,000 followers I have right now, 5,000 people will go visit their stuff. A little bit will like, but then they'll repost. We'll share each other's stuff and it all, you should want them to see other people. You don't to need help to be other people. threatened. But I can see that on social media, a lot of people, they'll, I mean, your content gets stolen. And then you're like, why don't you just give them credit? They're, they're afraid to give credit. That's a bad place to be because you're, you're jealous, you're insecure, you're, you know, I'll tag anyone, I don't care. I'll debate anyone. I'm not threatened, I, you know, I have nothing to hide. I just posted something yesterday, a correction, because I was wrong. I reached out to a professor, I was wrong. And so that mindset, and this is what's hard in being in fitness because think of a pie chart, okay? And you've got three things. You've got your physique, 
and your strength, okay? That's a third of it. You've got your, your mental health and your outlook and everything. That's another third. And then a final third is your business. Right. I can do any one of those three. I can kick butt at it. You know, if you said, Brett, in two months, we're going to take a bunch of pictures of you or you got to get up on stage. <laughs> um, I would lose 30 pounds and show up for me looking good. <laughs> Not like I could look like some bodybuilder or anything, but I would look good. I could do it. If you said, Brett, you need to be in a good place. You need to be in balance. I could go to the beach, read, relax, make sure I sleep well. And then if you said, Brett, you need to make an extra, you know, in the next three months, you need to make an extra 200 grand. I could do that no problem. Now do it all three of them at once. That's impossible for me. I can do one. It's really hard to be in balance. Right. But you can't neglect. I got a little too busy last year and I got irritable. Uh, people started calling me out. And I, it's a reminder. You got to listen to people, you know, start sleeping better and having a better outlook and also be easier on people. You know, you can crack the whip and be really hard on your employees, but they're not in the same place you are. And I have to look back to when I was 27 years old, I wasn't the guy I am now. So I got to learn to relax and be easy on them. I ride my workers hard. I, I compensate them well, but I push them hard, you know? Yeah, yeah. So two more questions before we finish. So the, the first one, and if I, if I didn't ask this, it, you know, I'd, I'd have lots of people saying, why didn't you ask about glutes? So just a couple of questions about glutes. So what, what you know, what, what should people be training? You know, effective exercises, effective equipment, you know, just got to touch glutes. What do you, what do you, what do you say on that? The best thing I could say to your followers on glutes is I made this post about a year and a half ago that I call the rule of thirds. All right. Now my, in the research, it's crazy because there's studies now showing that like five to 10 sets a week per muscle group is the optimal amount of volume. If you train to failure, right and you don't need to do more than that. And here my girls are doing 50 sets a week. And so it's like, how do they see good results? Are they doing too much? No, I think a lot of my followers do do too much. Right. At the point they're not strong, but they're doing every exercise in the world. But I have this rule of thirds that makes it nice and easy to, like an easy kind of system. And every week I don't make sure it's perfect, but basically a third of your exercises should be horizontal hip extension exercise. That's your hip thrusts, your glute bridges, your back extensions, your reverse hypers, anything where the load comes horizontally. A th another third should be vertical. That's your squats, your lunges, your deadlifts. So those are the, the squats and deadlifts and, and lunges are the hardest on your body. They, they work a lot of muscle. They work you in the stretch. They create more muscle damage. They can create more central nervous system fatigue and things like that. And then an, the final third should be lateral rotary. Those are your abduction and extra rotation movements. Those don't beat you up much. Those are easy on the body and they don't, but they work the upper glutes really well. And the upper glutes can contribute very well. They build that shelf. Right. All right. Now that's one part of the rule of thirds. There's two more parts. Also a third of your sets should be heavy. A third should be moderate and a third light. Okay, so yes, you go heavy, but it's only a third of it. Moderate and then light, a lot of, you know, high reps. And then a, the final component is that a third of your sets should be carried out like to failure or maybe a, a rep shy of failure. Right. Okay, you're pushing it really hard on those sets. <clears throat> another third should be, you know, two to three reps shy of failure. And then another third should be nowhere close to failure, you know. So you're getting in a lot of volume that, that helps you not only avoid overuse injuries, but it helps you get a lot of volume in without overtraining. Mm. And it makes sure you hit all the regions of the glutes that you develop all the different, and that you're using enough variety to prevent, you know, some of these overuse injuries and things like that. So that's probably my main. Yeah, that's yeah. good advice. And how many repetitions are you, are you doing on them? Well, it, uh, again, that depends, but um, the sweet spot is probably eight to 12. Mm -hmm. That's, but it depends on the exercises. You don't do frog pumps or lateral band walks for sets of eight to 12. Those you do higher reps. Right. Uh, with, you know, some lifts lend themselves well to one rep maxes, squats, deadlifts, um, hip thrusts, you probably want to do sets of five. You can do a one rep max for fun on Instagram. It looks cool, but it doesn't build the glutes that well. Now, so uh, it depends, but interestingly, when you conduct training studies, you learn a lot. And yeah. so, 
we, we do, we'll do have like a, a study showing heavyweights versus lightweights on muscle hypertrophy and strength, okay? The heavyweight group gains greater strength, gains greater strength but they, e they build equal hypertrophy. So you can build muscle equally well going heavy or going light, as long as you go close to failure. But here's the problem. The heavy group takes a lot longer. You know, the powerlifting style workouts, you've got to be in the gym for longer to acquire, accumulate enough volume, but it also beats up their joints. So by the end of the eight weeks, these powerlifting style training, all the subjects will say, I feel like I need a week off or I'm going to hurt myself. Conversely, when you go really high reps to failure, you try a set of 20 to 30 reps of, I mean, even doing leg extensions is hard, but you try a set of squats to failure at 20 to 30 reps, oh my God, these people will get nauseous. And a lot of them drop out because of nausea. So that's why I like the six to 15 window yeah. is best for a, nice lot of this, people, yeah. a lot of the situations, but you can stray. Yeah. It just, uh, and that's what's fun too. It's fun to test your strength sometimes. It's also fun to rep out if you're not feeling good. So use it all. Yeah. And final question, Escape Your Limits is about escaping what either you've believed is impossible yourself or other people have told you is impossible. What would be a recent example of you escaping your own personal limits? So funny. Uh, you know what movie was on last night? That Steve Jobs movie. Not the one with Ashton Kutcher, but the other one. And he had his reality distortion field. And on the movie he said, if you, you know, if I had a dollar for every time someone told me something's impossible and I, and I actually did it. Um, but I, I, heck, if you would have, you, know, you know, okay. You know, this guy Dan John called me today. He was a legend. He's, a, he's the most respected strength coach. He invented goblet squats, okay, right. where you hold the dumbbell here. And 10 years ago, in 2006, I went to my first seminar. And I, I waited in the lobby, hoping I'd see him. And I bought him a, like a scotch or something, what he, whatever he drinks. And we had a talk. If you would have told me 13 years later, he'd be calling you on the phone. But he called me up to thank me. And he's like, I have a file on my folder on my desktop of just your stuff that I saved. I screenshot it and save. And he's like, I just, I just want to thank you. If you would have told me 13 years ago, the tables are going to turn. Brett, <laughs> Dan John's going to be calling you. Not saying the tables have turned. He's a legend. But I'm the social media rock star now. Right. I don't, he's still up here in my eyes, and I'm down here. But yeah. anyway, I would have said there's no way that would happen. And, so, and even just what I've been able to, how I've been able to influence the industry so yeah, I don't think you should uh, put limits on yourself. And who knows what, you know, and who knows what, what else is in store for me in, in my life. And so I think it's important to have high expectations and high ambitions, but to not be so, um, to be fluid to where things don't end up the way you think you're going to, yeah. even no matter what. You think that, that you're going to end up, that your career path is going this way, it'll go this way, it'll go this way, and then you'll end up, but as long as you're working hard like what we've described in this podcast, you'll do just fine. Yeah. Brett, you've got a wonderful story. Um, I've got a lot of admiration for what you've achieved, and I wish you success in the future, and thank you very much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you.